All right, so today we are going to conclude our discussion of optimization, finally. Um, and so actually, uh, possibly today's lecture will be a little shorter. I always say that, and then it never ends up being the case, but today might be the day. Um, so, so basically, the, uh, the last little bit of our, our, our lectures here are going to cover uh, certain methods that, that basically are, are built on a particular object called the proximal operator. Um, there are a lot of different ways to motivate that, and one of them is through the lens of alternating optimization. So I think the alternating optimization, the way that we saw it in our previous lecture, makes perfect sense, right? I mean, we have a function of more than one variable. We kind of optimize with respect to one variable at a time. And at the very least, the objective function decreases in every step. Sometimes the iterates converge. Sometimes they don't. I think typically they do. It's very, again, quite hard to find a case where they don't. Um, it's even harder to find a case where the iterates don't contain a subsequence that converges. I'll let you guys think about why. Um, but uh, in any event, we can think about uh, a more kind of general uh, version of this story that's going to lead us to deal with constraints and, and, and eventually to a very popular technique in the world of convex analysis, which is something called ADMM. Before we're doing that, by the way, I thought I would give you one more interesting use case for alternation because a, a few of you guys mentioned that you like uh, sort of parallel computing, that kind of universe. There are a lot of optimization problems where your optimization variables are associated to the vertices of a graph. I'm drawing a graph mostly for my own entertainment. Okay, there's a graph. Uh, and so, uh, for instance, like let's say that, um, what's a typical one? So like maybe in semi-supervised learning, this is my social network, you know, over here I have like a very wealthy person, and over here uh, somebody a little bit less so, and my job because I work at some terrible company or another is to predict everybody's income in between. A very typical model here might be like, you know, I'm friends with people that have similar income to me. Um, in which case, like, what might be your objective function B? It could be something like, you know, if each of my vertices is labeled V, then maybe for every V W in my edge set, I take the value at one vertex, the value at the other vertex, and like I square, something like that, right? Uh, in this case, subject to like the data I know being prescribed at certain vertices. But there are a lot of energies that have this kind of feel to them, where like I have a graph, and then essentially, there's like some sum over the edges of my graph of an objective term uh, that involves unknowns that are like associated with the vertices. Right? This is a very typical situation in physics, many other places. So uh, there's another reason that, that I might want to do alternating optimization, which is uh, the following. So uh, in particular, let's say that I actually color my graph. Um, and in fact, actually, coloring is, is maybe the, not the right, no, actually, this is the right term here. So in particular, I'm going to put a label on every vertex, just like an integer from one to whatever, I guess four, <laughs> um, or larger. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to have the property that if two vertices share the, the same edge, they can't have the same label. Okay? I'm going to use a greedy algorithm for this, so let's color my graph. I've got, that's in one, so we'll put this in two, maybe we'll put that in one, here we can put it. This one in one, this guy can be in two. Oops, no, it can't. Um, can't be in one or two, so we'll make it a three. This can't be one and three, so it's two, two and three, one, and I don't know, three. There we go. So I colored my graph. <laughs> I believe optimally, but only for this specific graph. Um, here's kind of an interesting thing. So, so, I, so remember, in problems like this, I have an optimization variable associated with every single vertex in this graph. And so I can take this sum, and I can split it up into the sums in set one, the sums in set two, and the sum in set three. Right? I, I, I can happily do that. Then here's kind of an interesting thing. Let's say that I want to optimize this guy. Right? I have a bunch of objective terms that involve the relationship between this guy, this guy, and, oops, and, and this guy here. Right? Notice, let's say that I held everything except for the ones Fixed, right? So uh, this piece of my graph is held constant. <laughs> Here's the thing. So let's say that I have a multi-threaded computer, as we often do. Um, do the threads that are optimizing this vertex and this vertex need any communication at all if I fix all of the variables in the other colors? This is actually no, right? Because I can put any value I want here. And it doesn't affect the optimization problem for this one so long as its neighbors are held fixed, right? Because the objective terms only involve the outgoing edges here. 
right? So this is actually a very typical strategy for parallelism. You see that? What I can do is I can take my, my variables that are associated with a graph here. I can color my graph. Optimally coloring it might be annoying, but as you can see, I just did it on the board like a pretty reasonable heuristic very fast. I believe it's within some constant factor, but it's been a couple years since I've taught algorithms. Um, Chris suddenly is like, constant factor? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, right, so what can I do? I can basically say, okay, um, I can take my variables and I can partition them into sets that don't interact, right? So any two variables in set one can be processed in parallel without like having the, the case where if I change one of them, I need to change the other in response, right? Um, and so a very typical kind of parallel strategy will just like cycle through these three sets and optimize, you know, like choose that for coordinate descent. And the reason is that even though this thing, you know, there might be like in this case, there's one, two, three, four vertices in set one, notice that like these four things, I don't need to solve like a four by four problem. I just need to solve a bunch of one by one problems that are all don't communicate with one another. So this is a massively parallel operation, right? And so for problems that are structured like this, where your graph of communication is relatively limited, which is actually very typical, um, this is a really nice strategy for, for optimization. It's kind of suggestive of a lot of strategies people use. In fact, um, we're gonna talk about ADMM in a minute. You can actually cook up versions of ADMM where like that's really the reason why people have made it that way. Like they split the variables in such a way that the individual steps are cleanly parallelized. But anyway, I just wanted to mention that like we talked about alternation in two extremes. One is like you only have two sets of variables and you do it for like convenience of the underlying problem. Like, like in um, the ARAP problem that you did in your homework, the reason that I alternate isn't parallelism, it's because when I fix one set of variables, the other problem becomes SVD and when I fix those things, it becomes least squares, whereas jointly it becomes just a mess, right? In this case, the reason that I might want to do alternation is now I can do a very parallel thing that I couldn't have done before, right? If I want to optimize all these things at the same time, then like I need all kinds of like locks and, and threads because I can't guarantee, like I can't change my value here without affecting the values of my neighbors. Yeah, Axel. Uh, for integer value, uh, I, I mean this, this trick uh, where I have an objective function of, of this form is certainly fine, but well, you can't exactly use Newton's method for an integer value thing. Yeah. So like your subroutine for optimizing every vertex would look combinatorial in that case. Uh, yeah, in fact, I guess um, writ large alternation, the, the nice uh, thing there, you know that the objective value decreases in every step, right? So if you have a finite set of variables, then you really can justify that the algorithm has to converge, right? Um, because there's a finite set of possible objective values your, your thing can obtain. <laughs> Doesn't have to converge to the global optimum though, so you have to be a little careful. Yeah. We don't talk too much about discrete problem, the problems in this class, but there, there are lots of really hard ones. <laughs> okay, so um, there's one particular class of alternating algorithms that we're gonna spend some time on today. Um, and it's a bit specific, like I don't think you would typically encounter this in numerical methods class. I think numerical methods, you typically spend a lot of time on Newton's method, <laughs> and not so much on these, these specialized techniques, but the reason that I'm really highlighting them in this course, I think, is if you want to go into modern machine learning or, or statistics, these are the algorithms you see, in addition to just stochastic gradient methods, um, because you, your, your objectives kind of fall into one of two categories, either giant machine learning neural network thing that I don't know how to optimize beyond taking a gradient, or very carefully designed statistical model that has all this beautiful structure that I really should be using. Right? I think th these methods like Newton and BFGS are like somehow a middle ground that you don't see quite as often these days. Um, so I thought we'd do one example of, of this for, for, that shows up in statistics and learning all the time. And the motivation actually comes from something we discussed a few weeks ago. Do you guys remember this story? So if I want to solve a, a constrained optimization problem, like minimize f of x subject to g of x equals zero, then one way I can kind of interpret this to use sort of game theoretical looking language, if you want, is using as, as a minimax problem, right? So like I'm minimizing with respect to x, notice I've placed my parentheses carefully here. <laughs> this function with respect to x that tries to maximize with respect to lambda this inner thing, right? And as a bit of a reminder, let's say that x does not satisfy the constraints of the left-hand side problem, then what is gonna be the optimal value here of the inner maximum problem? Sure, so 
uh, let's say that I take an x and g of x is not equal to zero. Okay? Then what is the optimal value of this max over lambda? Infinity, right? Because g of x is not equal to zero. I'm multiplying it by lambda. I'm trying to max it over lambda. It's unconstrained. So I might as well just take g of x and multiply it by a ginormous number, right? On the other hand, if x does satisfy the constraint, what is the solution to the, the, inner, the, the, the value of the inner problem? Well, now g of x is zero. So no matter what lambda I put here, I just get f of x, right? So hopefully you guys see this informal argument that these two problems are equivalent in this kind of weird universe, which, by the way, is the extended real numbers, right? It's the real numbers plus infinity. <laughs> okay. This is actually suggestive of some optimization algorithms, right? Like I could do a gradient descent step in x and then a gradient ascent step in lambda and hope that somehow like these two things converge to some happy medium. Does that make sense? And in fact, there are a lot of algorithms that do exactly this. So, so again, in fact, the gradient ascent step in lambda is very e simple, right? It's just going to add a multiple of g to lambda. You can kind of see it in the formula here. And the gradient descent step is just the gradient of f minus, you know, lambda times gradient of g. Yeah. Now, it turns out that method very rarely converges. There's some, there's some, there's some situations you get lucky and it does. But, uh, you know, it can kind of easily spiral out of control. <laughs> um, but there are different uh, strategies that people use to stabilize it. And there's one in the history of optimization which is kind of interesting because it was proposed by theorists first. And you can prove that it converges in a lot of cases. The only problem is it's not super helpful. <laughs> Um, but then it turned out that like a, a special case of that method is the standard that everybody uses to derive a lot of fancy algorithms today. Um, and so, so historically, the one that came first is this technique here. Um, just out of curiosity, have anybody actually seen this buzzword before? No, oh, Paul had. It has it. So this is called the augmented Lagrangian method. Now, here's a kind of stupid <laughs> thing. <laughs> There's a lot of that today. Right, like, I think a lot of these optimization techniques are kind of funny. Boom. Booms lift. 30 minutes left. I get it. Um, <laughs> that's the following. So let's say that I want to solve. Okay. So. If you think about the Lagrange multiplier situation we had on the previous slide, if I do this with this like alternating, you know, x ascent or x descent and lambda ascent, those two things are kind of at odds, right? Like decreasing the objective function is what x wants to do, and lambda wants to increase the objective function in some sense. Yes. You can, but lots of systems of equations don't have closed form solutions. Do absolutely. You could try SQP. You could try all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so, so in some sense, when you're doing the gradient descent step, like really what it's trying to do is make f small. <laughs> and when, when you're doing the gradient, the the dual ascent step, it's trying to make g equal to zero. And those two things are like not agreeing with each other, right? It's like two people playing a game that have like different goals in life. Um, and so, like, there's a little bit of an intuition here, which is a little sneaky and stupid sounding at first. And essentially what it does is it combines, to go to, to Axel's question, um, two strategies that we've already seen. In particular, remember when we talked about um, solving constraint problems, there were kind of two classes of methods here, right? There were active set methods and there were barrier methods. Yeah, a little bit of review. Does anyone want to help us? Like, so what was the difference between these two things? Yeah. And then the actual set method would kind of like find equality conditions and then try to enforce them exactly. Yeah? The one method you might use once you know your active set is one of these like primal dual, you know, like ascent descent kind of things. But here's kind of an interesting little sneaky observation. I can actually combine these two perspectives. And here's a, a thing that initially feels really dumb, but actually is going to turn out to be exactly what you want to do. So I'm going to add a barrier to my objective function. Like that. So consider the optimization problem that I've written on the board here. So it's minimize f plus rho over 2 g squared subject to g equals 0. What can we say about the optima of this problem for any rho greater than 0? Yeah, 
yeah, the ultimate is like this, this constraint wasn't here, right? Because if I enforce this constraint, then I'm just, this is like the world's most complicated way of writing, you know, f of x plus zero. Do you see that? So initially this feels kind of dumb. <laughs> That's because it is. <laughs> However, um, if you look back, right, to our, our sort of minimax formulation here, take a look at this problem for x now. Even if I hold lambda fixed and I optimize for x, now there's like at least a little rubber band that says that when I optimize for x, I don't want to forget the constraint completely, right? So there's like at least a little bit of a thing kind of tugging me back toward my constraint set, even when I'm only optimizing for the variables without even thinking about the constraint. Does that make sense? So that's the basic intuition um, for this, this algorithm called the augmented Lagrangian method. By the way, we're not going to prove convergence for this because these are a little bit tricky. Um, but the augmented Lagrangian method does the following. It wants to do uh, gradient ascent on lambda, because remember it wants to be maximum with respect to lambda. It does gradient descent with respect to x. In fact, but better than gradient descent, um, maybe I'm able to actually just minimize this function with respect to uh, x completely, right? That's obviously better than taking a gradient step, yeah? Um, and the way that it does that is it operates on this object that we call the augmented Lagrangian. In particular, let's do the Lagrange multiplier condition for this thing. Right? So what's the Lagrangian of this? It's a function of rho x given uh, lambda here, uh, f of x plus rho over 2 mod g of x squared. And now, um, da -da, uh, lambda transpose g of x, like that. Right? This is our complete function. So we're going to uh, maximize with respect to this guy, minimize with respect to that. So this method is called augmented Lagrangian method. And it turns out for convex G, or, or for convex F and convex G, um, this method often con converges, in fact, uh, uh, unconditionally. Um, by the way, when I say convex G, that should like set off your spider sense, because like, let's say G is real valued. <laughs> then what is the only convex constraint that could be for G? It would have to be linear, <laughs> right? Because any equality constraint, which is convex, is necessarily linear. Um, However, there's a little sleight of hand that happens here, which is that we're going to allow our functions f comma g, you know, the input points in like Rn, but the output points in, uh, I was about to write something that was incorrect, <laughs> the union of R and plus or minus infinity. Okay, so our, my functions can, they can output either a number or they can just output infinity. So, Let's say that I want to enforce a constraint that says something like this, like I'm in the unit disk. The one thing I can do is I can define a constraint g of x as follows. I can say it's equal to 0 if uh, x is less than or equal to 1 and infinity otherwise. This is a weird function. It, it only exists because we allow our functions to output infinity. Do you see that? But notice that uh, now this constraint g of x equals 0, first of all, notice that that's exactly the same as saying I'm in, inside of the unit disk. And moreover, g is actually a convex function. Do you see that? Um, so for example, uh, here, so it's 0 inside here. It's infinity inside of here, right? So what does convexity say? It says if I take any two points and I draw a little line between them, I look at the value of g, then it's somehow underneath the line that I get by interpolating. Well, what is this line? Well, it's just infinity everywhere. <laughs> so it's clearly below that. Yeah. So this is just like a mathematical sleight of hand to include uh, hard constraints in, in these problems. Yes, Axel. Ah. So think about a parabola. But remember that this is not like the super level set of the problem. It's literally a parabola. This is not a convex set. So if I take two points and I connect them, it doesn't contain the line between these two points. Yeah. Cool. OK, so this algorithm works uh, in theory. You can prove its convergence. Fun fact. Um, so what does this thing do? Again, it optimizes for x with lambda fixed, and then it updates lambda. The only problem is that like, it's very hard to find 
an FG pair where this thing is a practical and useful method. <laughs> this is more of just like an interesting theoretical object. But a special case of this method turns out to be extremely popular and useful in all kinds of branches of machine learning, statistics, optimization, you name it. And that is for functions of the following form. So here, this is minimizing the sum of f of x plus h of z subject to ax plus bz equals c. <laughs> okay? Now, initially, this feels like a really weird set of functions. Okay? And our constraint, by the way, we're going to... The original version of this assumes that f and h are convex. It turns out you can relax that assumption for certain classes of functions. Um, in fact, if you read a lot of graphics and machine learning and computer vision papers, they often use all kinds of weird choices for f and h and just don't think too hard about whether it should work or not. They just try it empirically. Um, but this uh, algorithm is going to be guaranteed to work so long as f and h are convex under some pretty weak conditions. So uh, what we're going to do is a slight generalization of the augmented Lagrangian method. Okay? Here's what it's going to look like. So actually, before we go into the details of what it looks like, let's convince ourselves that this is actually like kind of a reasonable format <laughs> for a problem. Um, so uh, let's try a few. Uh, so for example, um, how about uh, minimize x, uh, like the one norm of x plus ax minus b. There are a few things we could do. Obviously, we could just take this whole thing equal to f. <laughs> that's going to turn out to be a bad idea for practical reasons. Um, or the, the, the version that's going to be more amenable to the algorithm we'll talk about in a minute is going to do the following. It'll take, uh, it'll say minimize maybe the one norm of x plus az minus b subject to x plus z is equal to, uh, x minus z is equal to zero. <laughs> this is, do you see that these, obviously these two problems are equivalent? Right? All I did was say set x equal to zero. And the, the reason that this is going to be nice is we're going to essentially alternate between x and z. And so now the z problem kind of looks like least squares, and the x problem is kind of one-dimensional. We're going to do some examples of this, not to worry. <laughs> um, how about a different one? How about... Um, Man, we like least squares problems in this class. So in fact, let's do the problem on the exam. Like that. Ah, this is a two norm. Well, we can actually write it in a very similar form. This is actually kind of a pattern in ADMM. We might do the following. We say AX minus B plus, and I'm going to introduce a new notation for you. This is called chi. By the way, chi in convex analysis and chi in, in some other branches of math are a little different. Also in my geometry class, I suppose chi is very different than the chi we'll talk about here, but I don't think you'd get those confused. Um, uh, of the following, like that. Um, so what is, uh, essentially, when, when we use this notation, what we mean is that this is the function which is zero when x satisfies this constraint and infinity when it doesn't. So it's like exactly what we had on the, the thing I wrote down before. Okay? This is very typical notation. It's called the indicator. It is not zero and one, it is zero and infinity in convex analysis. Is there like the convex arrows on the delta for the convex arrows indicator? Is it the measure theorist indicator? Okay, great. Measure theory. I don't really care. Yeah, whatever. Um, no, I, I, I don't think that's right. In the ADMM literature, it's typically chi. Uh, at least in the ones I read. The, at least the papers that I wrote. And the good news is there are many of them now. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, 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 so we, we call it Kai. And on, on Thursdays we wear pink. Um, okay, so, uh, right. Uh, or what we're going to see in a minute once again is like doing a similar thing. Uh, it's going to be a useful simplification. For now, these are just different ways of writing the same problem. We don't, we don't know why this one might be useful. Or, by the way, there could be a third thing we could do, um, which is also equivalent, which is the following. And this is all just to convince you that there are so many different ways to write down the same problem. Subject to um, AX minus, minus Z equals B. 
Do you guys see that this is actually, again, in the form of what we have on the slide here? We have a function of z, a function of x, they're both convex, and a linear constraint linking them together. And notice that z is equal to ax minus b. So this is actually, once again, the same, the same problem. So this is all just to convince you that like, there's this huge class of problems that you can write in this form. Yeah? In fact, there's a fantastic survey by uh, Floyd and uh, I believe Parikh Neil is on there um, and some others. There's a pair of papers that goes, and it's, it's really nice, it's, it's just a survey paper. What they do is they say, ADMM is a useful algorithm. Let's just choose everybody's favorite like 50 convex problems and write them in this form and show that you get a practical thing out. So this is like a good life skill. Everybody should wake up every morning and derive like at least three ADMM iterations before breakfast. Yes? So what's the second one? Void and... Oh, uh, what, you can't read that? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I really tried. <laughs> uh, P-A-R-I-K-H. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure that's right. If you, yeah, okay. <laughs> you may notice that I do a lot of this off the top of my head, which is mildly dangerous when it comes to like authors of research papers. By the way, incidentally, like today's lecture and the last lecture, we've zoomed forward about 200 years past the algorithms we were doing before that, right? Like these are these are very modern things. Okay, so hopefully we've convinced you that like there's so many problems that can be written in this form. This is a very common form. Incidentally, another one is semi-definite programming, like. Uh, or, or even uh, linear programming, all of these things fall into this, this category. Okay, so the trick, like ADMM is one of these interesting algorithms that's half science and half art. So in particular, the science is just you know, showing that this method converges. The art is that this is going to be what we'll call a meta-algorithm. Because what it's gonna do is it's gonna write the algorithm in terms of f and g, and then what we're gonna show is that for many terms of f and g, when I kind of substitute them into the form of the algorithm, I get an iteration which is really efficient and clean. It's interesting the way that people talk about this. They really do, they call it like meta technique or something like that. This is different than like what hyperparameter search or whatever machine learning people do. Okay, so here's gonna be our, our algorithm. It's very simple. And then we're going to do a few examples, and then we'll probably actually call it a day rather than starting a new topic. Okay. So, what is the augmented Lagrangian of this object? Remember what that means. That's just the Lagrangian of this thing, plus like a soft term that enforces the constraint. I'm saying math words very quickly, but hopefully you guys remember this from earlier in lecture. So let's let's write it down. So in particular, the uh, augmented Lagrangian is a function of x, z and the dual variable, lambda, right? And it's gonna be the objective function, so this is uh, f of uh, x plus h of z. By the way, I chose notation to match this void survey because I'm a nice guy, so you can read either that or the book chapter and they'll, they'll give you the same. Um, then we've got our fuzzy term. Uh, let's see, how do we wanna write it? How about a x plus b z minus c, like that, right? So this is the kind of fuzzy thing that kind of wants to enforce the constraint. By the way, I could stop here and I would get x and z that like roughly satisfy the constraint. But then the kind of funny thing in augmented Lagrangian method is we do that and then we also enforce the constraint at the same time. It's kind of strange, right? Um, plus lambda uh, tra uh, uh, transpose times a x plus b z minus c. This is it. Ta-da! Augmented Lagrangian. Everybody agree with me that this is Lagrange multipliers of our original thing, just plus this like weird useless term? Okay. So the ADMM algorithm does a really, really simple thing. So I have estimates of x, v, z, and lambda that I'm gonna maintain. What I'm gonna do is update x, update z, update lambda, x, update x, z, lambda, x, z, lambda, and so on. Okay? So step one, right, so there's our Lagrangian is the following, it's gonna be, uh, it's, 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 we're gonna say that x gets um, the argument, so just minimize x of lambda rho. So in other words, I'm gonna hold, remember we're talking about alternation today. I'm gonna hold the z and lambda fixed and I'm gonna optimize respect to x, yeah? What do you think step two is gonna be? 
See, thank you. Put me out of my misery. This guy. Okay. Looks to be a third step. Lambda. Okay. Well, we have to be the tiniest bit careful because I want to maximize with respect to lambda. Should I write argmax lambda here? What was that? Need to. Uh, need to, uh, no, <laughs> um, should I maximize with respect to lambda with x and z fixed? Take a look at the augmented Lagrangian. What, 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 would, what would happen? This function is linear in lambda, yeah? So if I maximize with respect to lambda, it's going to be infinity. So that's actually not a useful step. So the kind of interesting thing that happens in ADMM is you do argument of x and z, because those are functions with nice curvature. In fact, they're guaranteed to have nice curvature. That's one thing that this um, augmented term does, is it makes it a strongly convex problem. But it's not strongly convex in lambda. So instead, I do gradient ascent. <laughs> uh, in particular, I do lambda plus rho times the uh, constraint. A x minus c. You guys see this is just the gradient of this thing. Incidentally, this row multiplier is a sort of standard choice, but it could be something smaller. It doesn't actually matter. If you think about it, it's like kind of corresponds to the scaling of the constraint. I believe this is the one where the theoretical analysis ends up looking the cleanest. So, any questions so far? Ah, so this is the gradient with respect to lambda. So that's only this thing, right? So this, this thing here is grad of, uh, like that, right? And that's exactly what's here. No, I mean, the standard is to use the same row for, for both. This row is kind of like the learning rate for the dual step. Uh, it turns out that this particular choice of row has some nice property, but it's, it's actually not entirely important. Oh uh, yeah, so so all these are the same row, all the same row, every single side. Okay, so that's uh, that's the ADMM algorithm. Now the way I presented it to you here, it looks useless, right? Like like for like about seventy-two different reasons. Do you see that? So so like, in particular, I mean, our whole goal in life—you didn't know it, but it's true. Our goal in life is to solve optimization problems, and you know, I just told you ADMM is this fantastic optimization algorithm. But here's the problem. What are the steps of, of ADMM? The steps of ADMM are call somebody else's optimization method. Right? So presented to you like this, this is no good. <laughs> right? Incidentally, by the way, if you believe ADMM converges, notice that um, uh, this thing also has to converge. Like, if, if, for instance, if you just had z, uh, h of z equal to 0, you, you'd recover some version of this. But uh, at least for a linear constraint. OK. So this is where so this is the theory of ADMM. It's like you can prove all kinds of nice theory about the algorithms of this form, generically speaking. For instance, this has a linear convergence rate. And the, the proof isn't that hard. It's actually very much within the scope of this class. If you open up the Boyd survey, you can read it. It's just like yet another annoying analytical calculation. So we're gonna omit it. However, it's not so clear that this thing is useful. And the like the really brilliant observation, I mean, like this I think has been known for a long time. The brilliant observation more recently is like, oh, so many things fall into this template, and if we do it just right, we can derive an efficient optimization technique. And this is why this is a meta-optimization algorithm, because we're going to choose specific f and h and show that if we design lambda really, really carefully, we can have a really efficient technique. So I think the best way to see that is to just do an example, and then we're going to see kind of why, why, why this might happen. In fact, we can do one example I've prepared, and if you want, then I don't know, you can name your favorite convex thing, and we can just do it live. We've got some time. I'm pretty good at ADMM, so there's some chance we can get it right. So, as a simple example, let's say that I want to do non-negative least squares. It's a very simple problem, and it's one that shows up in practice a lot. Like, you know, I want to do regression, but I know that my variables are positively correlated. It's like a totally reasonable 
assumption. Um, so in other words, what I'd like to solve is the following. I want to solve, uh, the, I want to minimize with respect to x, our favorite objective. Sorry, guys. You might think we're done with the, uh, this, this problem. We're not. Um, subject to the constraint that x is non-negative. Right? So for instance, if I add more fertilizers, fertilizer to my plant, I know that my plant should get taller. Um, so I know that if I got a negative loading, something went wrong. So I'm just going to constrain it to be positive. Does the problem make sense? OK. So I claim that there exists a really easily implemented and fairly efficient algorithm for solving this thing with, with ADMS. And let's, like, let's try version 1.0 and see that it fails, and then see that there's a, a better way to do it. So and this is where the kind of art comes in. So very obviously, this problem could be written in this, this, the, the form of, of what's on the slide. right? So for instance, I could take f of x to be equal to ax minus b squared plus chi of x squared equal to 0. I could take g of x to be 0. I could take a equals b equals 0. And I could take c equals 0. And notice that this thing is now technically in the form that I have put on the slide. That's an equal, if you're wondering. Right? I mean, like, cl clearly I could take this problem and I can write it this way. And the question is, is was this a useful thing that I just did? <laughs> right? And the answer is, is very clearly no. So, so um, in, per in particular, so what's going to be our augmented Lagrangian in this case? Well, it's going to be <laughs> ax minus b squared plus chi x squared equals 0 plus 0. Right? Everything else went away <laughs> in our augmented Lagrangian. Yeah? So what's going to be step one of ADMM? Yeah, step one of, our, uh, of ADMM is going to be solve my original problem. <laughs> Do you see that? <laughs> so clearly, the, you know, the, this is where the art of the science. So, did the, so first of all, did the algorithm converge in that case? Absolutely, right? ADMM converged in one step, because step one was solve problem, step two was add zero to it, and step three was add another zero to it. And then I'm done, yeah. But this was not a particularly enlightening exercise we just did, right? So clearly, like just reducing it to some form, like what I've written on the slide, is not a particularly useful exercise. The the the, the interesting exercise is strategically choosing f and g to have some nice properties. You guys, do you see the point that I'm trying to make? Okay. So in order to do that, let's go back to our augmented Lagrangian and kind of like think a little bit more about the kind of properties that might be nice. And remember when we talked about alternating optimization, like for instance, when you guys implemented ARAP, we've talked about it a few times. Why did we do it? Well, we did it because when we held one set of variables fixed, and we optimized the other set of variables, somehow that was easier, like literally, like maybe it was least squares, whereas when I optimized them both jointly, I couldn't do that anymore, right? So essentially, exactly the same thing's going to come up, because notice that I never need to jointly consider x and z. Right? So the magic, the art, the beauty of ADMM techniques is going to be to strategically choose F and H so that they're like hard in different ways. <laughs> so that like optimizing one without the other is not going to be so difficult. Does that make sense? Okay. This is fun. I love these things. Um, okay. So, so, so let's, let's do this. In fact, I'm tempted to do this two different ways. I want to do this two different ways. We'll do the version of this in the book first, and then we'll do a second one because I feel like it. I've got time. Because I want to convince you that, like, this, this, and this really is an art because each one of these will converge linearly because that is a property of these three steps. It's not a property of the details that we're about to do. But the fact that the steps are efficient is going to be the, the property of the, the, what we're about to do. I think I've repeated myself about 82 times, but I want to drive that point home because this is one of these techniques that I think people often get wrong, like they'll choose crappy choice. I've seen this in research papers that I shall not name, at least on camera, um, where they will choose bad choices of, of F and H, and they'll say, well, ADMM seems to be an effective algorithm, so I'm going to split my objective in some weird way, and then solve F and H with like Newton's method each. 
like just ping pong back and forth between two Newton's method to minimize with respect to, to, to f, you know, x and, and z. You can certainly do that, but like then you might as well have done Newton's method on all the variables at the same time. The trick is that like you get special form if you do this right. So hopefully I repeated myself this time. So here is going to be our, 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 our magic. We're going to have a, like a hashtag spoiler alert for this one, and then maybe we'll throw one on your homework where I'll let you kind of puzzle through how to do this. Um, I claim that uh, the following is going to be a, a, a better splitting of this problem, which is actually what we wrote before. So we're going to have an x and a z, and we're going to do the following. We're going to have ax minus b. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take the, and this is a very typical pattern for ADMM, we are going to enforce the constraint on the other variable. So we're going to say like that. I'm going to have a constraint x minus z equal to zero. Okay. Now this problem is clearly equivalent to what we started with. Do we all agree with that? Yeah. No, that's acknowledgement. Okay. Please. Cool. Um, but here's the thing. This is going to lead me to a different ADMM algorithm because I just wrote it in a different form. Okay. So let's see that. This is so much fun. I love this algorithm. This is so beautiful. It's like really clean and nice and ah, I use it all the time. Okay, so um, what's going to be the augmented Lagrangian of my problem? Uh, X, we got a Z, we got a lambda in there. Okay, so we've got uh, AX minus B. We've got a, like that. We have a row over two. Um, that and then x minus z. Okay. That, this algorithm is beautiful but it also leads to giant formulas that are kind of annoying to simplify. Now when you are at home deriving your ADMM algorithms as you will do every day from now on before you brush your teeth, we've talked about this, you should write your augmented Lagrangian down, this thing, then should step back like at least 10 feet, so at least from like roughly where Chris is sitting. And then you should look at it and you say, well, you know, like you should look at your life and look at your choices and think very carefully and say, like, was this a good decision? And the way to think about it is the following. I need to optimize this thing with respect to x having z fixed, with respect to z holding x fixed. Now here I've given you a spoiler. Like I've just given you the, 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 the right answer. At home you're going to try a bunch of these and it's not going to be so nice and then you're, you're eventually going to converge on the right one. Um, in particular, if we, I'm gonna, I'll stand back from the right distance here. I look at my objective function here. It looks ugly. What is this problem? If z is constant and I only optimize with respect to x, what, what kind of problem is this thing? Yeah, it's just least squares. Do you see that? Like, what are the terms involving x? I've got this guy, and I got this guy, and I got this guy. This is linear, quadratic, quadratic, and God knows in this class we know how to solve that problem. <laughs> okay. Now what is the problem in z? This one's a little bit trickier, and we'll do it in more detail in a second. So the problem in z has a constraint now, right? Z has to be positive. So like, like uh-oh, like that's, that's a little bit scary. But here's the thing. Does, is the matrix A ever touch z? No. So if I hold everything fixed, this term goes away when I optimize with respect to z. This term is still here. I've got a term here and a term here. And what's nice about this problem is that this is going to decouple over the elements of z. Do you see that? Like z1, z2, z3, none of them talk to each other in this problem. And that's what's going to be so nice. The z problem is going to be a bunch of nonlinear one-dimensional problems. And the x problem is going to be one giant linear problem. Yeah? This is very typical, by the way. There's a lot of like network analysis algorithms that can be derived this way, where what's going to happen is that like the A is going to contain like the topology of a graph, so it's going to be like the way that my nodes talk to each other, and then I'm going to have some very nonlinear thing that happens at every node or every edge or something like that. And if you split your problem in just the right way, you can do this kind of thing. So does everybody understand the high level, like how I decided this was probably a good, what we call this the splitting of my problem. Okay, so let's actually work out this algorithm in detail, and then you should all try it at home, and you're going to see it's excruciatingly slow unless you fix it. <laughs> but I digress. Okay. So first thing we have to do, optimize with respect to z, or x rather. 
How should we do that? Well, we take the gradient, set it equal to zero, and see what happens. Yeah? Thanks, Paul. I don't think that's what you actually said, but I'm going to put that, that in your mouth. Yeah. Brilliant, this one. Yeah. Um, so, in particular, we have um, 2a transpose a x minus, how, are you guys tired of this calculation yet? Because we can keep doing it. Um, transpose b, uh, there's no x here. We have an x minus z, like that, and a uh, lambda. I'm not looking at my notes, so there's good probability that there's all kinds of factors of two missing. I don't think there are. Okay. So uh, in particular, like remember, we're trying to solve for x here, so we need to like do a little bit of grouping. So uh, we've got an a transpose a, and we got a row here, right? So this is going to look like two. I didn't do the thing where I snuck a one half here, which is why we have this annoying two, but it's fine. It's just it's just annoying. Um, and then we got a row uh, times identity times x equals, and now we've got all the other stuff, right? So we've got an a transpose b, uh, I guess plus rho z minus lambda, like that. Okay? Everybody agree with me? So, the x step of our, 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 our algorithm is very simple. So, so x is just the inverse of this times that. By the way, notice, this matrix is has a few properties that are kind of nice. Um, first of all, it is positive definite, right? Because it's, it's a positive semi-definite thing plus a multiple of the identity. Moreover, this does not depend on x, z, or lambda, right? So if I want to implement this very efficiently, I would pre-factor this matrix because it's going to be the same in every iteration of ADMM. What's going to change is the right-hand side because the right-hand side does depend on z and lambda. Does that make sense? This is cool. Now you can start to see why this algorithm is, 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 is nice. I'm going to keep saying that. I need validation. Okay. Thanks, team. Yes, Axel. Um, what's it turns out that this algorithm actually converges for any row, as long as it's positive. However, the conversion speed can be quite different. So in practice, what people do, um, so if, if you, if you kind of look at the augmented Lagrangian, You'll notice that the row is sort of how much you want to satisfy the constraint versus how much you want to optimize the objective. And so what people will do is like if the objective value isn't changing very much, they'll decrease row, and if it's changing too fast, it'll, it'll decrease it. There's some very simple heuristics for how to do that. That's right. Every time you change row, you got to refactor, which is a discouragement from like adjusting it every step. No, I mean, you could update a row at every step. Um, there are a lot of algorithms, by the way, where you do want to optimize, like, inverse this matrix with different choices of a row. Um, I think a very typical thing to do might be to, like, do this times 2 to the minus k for a few different k's and then just prefactor all of them and keep them around or something. Um, you can imagine different versions of this. But again, this is specific to this one objective function. I, this is not ADMM. This is ADMM for this problem. <laughs> Right? So like you're the engineer, you're presented with this problem. Yeah, you might, you might think of different things you could do. Okay, but let's, let's finish this off. So we've got our X iteration. This is looking like, like pretty, so far so good, yeah? Yeah, okay. So now let's think of our, our, our optimization for Z, okay? I guess it's okay if I erase ADMM since it's also on the screen here. I don't like the board on the back because then I can't put it, like, it will necessarily be covered by the next thing you write. Yeah, I was told in my teacher training to avoid using it until you might notice, Paul, that I have a heuristic, which is when we're in the last 10 minutes of lecture, then we can use the last board because you're unlikely to cover it. <laughs> Good observation. Okay, so, um, what was I doing? We're optimizing the to Z. <laughs> okay. One thing we can do is just like start slicing out terms that don't matter <laughs> here, right? Um, so what do we have? We have uh, the ax minus b goes away. We have a row over two mod x minus z like that. And then we've got a minus uh, lambda dot z like that. Um, and we, we really can, I mean, like, you know, in essence, we still know that 
I don't really need that kind notation, right? I could put back the constraint. This is just, this, this is just mostly to convince ourselves that we can write our, pro our problem in the form of, of ADMM. Does everybody agree that this is the problem we need to solve for this step of ADMM? Harry looks suspicious. Did I miss a constant factor? Oh, you're right. I've noticed this. I think this is like old age or something that like I'll say the correct thing and then write the completely wrong thing and like these parts of my brains just don't communicate. One. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, there, were, there, there were two versions of my notes. <laughs> there. <That> was <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Incidentally, you could replace the constraint with the norm of z less than or equal to 1, and you will get a, a tractable ADMM algorithm, but it won't look like the one we're about to derive. Thank you. Old age sucks. Okay, so, um, right, so this is our problem. But here's a very typical pattern. So the way that I've written it here, it's not obvious that it's, it's solvable cleanly, but notice that, like, let, let's actually write out this norm. So this is the sum over my elements i of rho over 2 xi minus zi squared minus lambda i zi, right? So all I did was take this thing and write it as a sum. Does that make sense? Is there any interaction between like z1 and z7? No. So this is actually equivalent to optimizing over each of the z's one by one without any knowledge of the other z's. So already we're in good shape. Even if this were like kind of complicated, at least it's 1D, yeah? But in fact, we can do better than that, yeah? And why is that? Well, in general, our constraint can either be inactive or active, yeah? And when my constraint is active for constraint i, what does that mean? That means zi is equal to zero. When my constraint is inactive, what does it mean? It means I'm at the minimum of a parabola, right? So let's, uh, let's work out the inactive case. Right, so uh, just for zi, so I'm going to get I'm going to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. That's right, Paul. And I'm going to get uh, rho xi minus, oh, oops, uh, zi minus xi, sorry. Like that, minus lambda i. Right? Now we're down to 1D calculus. Um, so in particular, you know, in this particular case, uh, I will get, what, L lambda uh, plus rho x all that divided by rho, so I guess it would be lambda over rho plus xi. Did I do that right? Math is hard. Lambda over rho. Yeah. Okay. So what is my z update? By the way, so yeah, what is my total z update? So otherwise active is zi equals zero. So here's one way to think about it. So I've got this parabola. Either its minimum is negative, in which case I shouldn't have used it, or it's positive, in which case I should have, right? So in other words, when we put all this stuff together, I get that z is equal to the max of lambda over rho plus x, like in kind of a vectorized format. You can put like vector of all ones there if you want. Um, or zero, element-wise. So notice. Step two of ADMM, it looks like an optimization problem for Z, but secretly it's just a formula, <laughs> right? This is cool, okay. And then step three is, is uh, just gradient ascent, yeah? So let's summarize our, our algorithm, okay? See, Paul, I'd like to use the bottom board, but now I can't. Hmm, in fact, maybe I will, just for fun. So um, 30 minutes left, uh, right, so, um, Step one, we're going to get x is going to be equal to, um, I guess, 2a transpose a plus rho i inverse times a transpose b plus rho z minus lambda, right? We've got step two, the z is going to be max of zero, and uh, see, now I can't see the board. It's gone. It's covered up. Um, uh, lambda over rho plus x. By the way, if I see z on the right-hand side of this expression, clearly something went wrong. Um, like that. Okay. And then the third one. 
is lambda, lambda plus rho times the constraint. Three lines of code. If I cycle through this thing, it will converge to the solution to non-negative least square, unconditionally, for any choice of rho. Now, let's step back like 100 feet and, and kind of ask ourselves, like, well, what do we do in this ADMM technique? <laughs> well, the real meat and potatoes of ADMM is very carefully writing our problem in a form where these three steps are each tractable, right? Like our first try at this, we just put and put everything in the first step, and then we didn't know how to solve it. But here, we very carefully split our variables in such a fashion that the x step and the z step independently are, are tractable objects. Does that make sense? Isn't that neat? And it turns out there's this huge class of, of convex problems. In fact, I don't think I've ever in my life encountered a convex problem that did not, cannot be written in some clean way in ADMM. Um, so I challenge you guys to cook up a good uh, formula for this. And Harry looks suspicious. He should. Um, there are also, this algorithm, special cases of ADMM can lead us to some really interesting um, algorithms. When I say algorithms, I mean like in the like, computer science perspective, like ways to optimize this thing efficiently with multiple processors and this kind of stuff. Um, so let's think of one example of this. So, by the way, I should pause. Is there any, any questions about what the calculation we just did? It turns out to be, well, because if you think about it, even when rho is zero, like, like, hopefully you agree that for any choice of rho, the optimum objective here is still the same. Like, rho actually does not affect the optimum at all, and because we have actually added lambda as a variable. And so that's what's really going on, is you just need something to push the objective toward, toward satisfying the constraint. I believe there are a lot of cases where even when rho is equal to zero, this algorithm succeeds, but I, I, but I think you need just a little bit of curvature to, to, to prove it or something. I'd have to look, go back and look at the proof to, to remember what, what goes wrong. No, you can have rho to be ginormous, but what will happen is that every step of your algorithm will not go very far. Yeah, so like, let's be concrete about that. So let's say, like, in fact, actually this algorithm is a good example. So let's say rho is really big. What's going to happen? Well, take a look at the x step. So this rho i is going to dominate, right? And this rho z is going to dominate. So this step is going to basically say, just take z and copy it into x, <laughs> right? So and, uh, in particular, <laughs> if rho is really big in this step, what's going to happen is going to say, take x and copy it into z. <laughs> Yeah, so if I choose a really, really ginormous row, clearly iterates of this method are not going to go very far. On the other hand, if I choose a really tiny row, right, now what's going to happen? So now I'm going to end up basically ignoring x when I optimize for z and vice versa. And so there's very little communication between the two variables. And so somehow any row will make this thing converge, but the number of iterations will be quite different. And that's, you can even, like, I think actually these two, I'm glad you asked that question because I think these formulas make it very concrete what goes on. Right? Yeah. Any other questions? And there really are, like, there's adaptive ADMM methods that say, like, oh, like, basically X and Z aren't changing, so I should decrease rho, right? Like, you can imagine very simple heuristics there. Yeah. So let's do a second example. Um, in fact, what we're going to do is take the ADMM meta algorithm. <laughs> And we're going to derive a different meta algorithm for a, another class of problems that's really important. And just for fun, just to convince you guys that like this is a very powerful tool. Like this is one of these things where uh, like once somebody proves to you that ADMM converges, you can go through a lot of other algorithms in the literature and show them in special cases. Um, so here's a good example. Can I can I erase some stuff? Is that okay? See, now I had to cover the board in the back. You'll never see it again. It's gone. Yeah. You, you see what you've done to me? Okay. So um, here's a very typical situation. Uh, I believe this is often called consensus optimization. Has anybody ever heard of this? Okay. So let's say that I have a bunch of uh, convex functions. Turns out convexity actually isn't really critical here, but whatever. And I want to solve the following property, following problem. I have a bunch of functions fi, and I sum them over i, and I want to minimize the sum. By the way, obviously, I could, if I wanted a weighted sum, I could put the weighted weights into fi. Yeah? Now, for example, the, the algorithm that we just worked out is a special case of this, right? But um, generically speaking, 
this is often the case, you know, like maybe, you know, you have a bunch of objective terms or maybe it's even like, you know, one of these problems on a graph and every edge contributes a term to your optimization objective. This is a very common thing. It's called consensus. And let's say that, like, moreover, we make an assumption, which is that, like, we can probably optimize any one of these FIs pretty easily. Like, maybe it only really involves a few elements of X, or it's, like, relatively simple. It's a very simple, it's a very standard situation. And the question is, can I cook up an algorithm that's extremely parallelizable, where what it's going to do is it's going to say, okay, I'm going to try and optimize each of the FIs independently, and then kind of glue them all back together. Does that make sense? How could I, how could I do that? Any ideas? What was that? Version, well, but I, I actually, fun fact, Harry, if, it turns out, so this is called two block ADMM. If I have more than two blocks, it, it does not necessarily converge. There's a magic, two is the magic number here. Often it converges, but not necessarily. It's actually the convergence proof. If you read it carefully, you'll see it doesn't, doesn't carry through. What else could I do? Well, like, do you kind of, kind of remember the strategy here? We started with AX minus V, and then we just like, kind of wrote an equivalent version. And, and again, this is part of the art of these ADMM methods, is to find the right equivalent version that, that's going to make sense for your problem. And here's, here's kind of a fun one. I'm spending way too much time on this. I should be getting to the end of this lecture, but this is fun. I, I, I'm having a little. This is not on my notes, so I'll probably get it wrong. Um, <clears throat> here's the thing that I could do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to have a bunch of vectors zi, <laughs> which are basically a bunch of copies of x. I'm going to have a linear constraint that x is equal to each of the zi's. This is going to be called consensus because what's going to happen is the zi's are going to converge to x. Does that make sense? So this sounds goofy, <laughs> but now let's kind of play through a little bit and see why this is going to lead us to an interesting ADMM algorithm. Um, yes, sorry. Okay, so you're, you're just flexing? Okay. <laughs> okay, fantastic. <laughs> So let's write the augmented Lagrangian of this thing. And this is going to be a problem where like, I'm obviously not going to be able to write like, a closed form step like what you just did, because there's still Fs in here. But we can at least kind of look back and see the kind of pattern it's going to yield, which is as follows. So let's see augmented Lagrangian of this thing. Uh, well, we've got Xs. By the way, the fact that the Zs are indexed by i is OK, so long as we optimize with respect to all of the Zs at the same time. Right? Um, and we've got a dual variable lambda. We have to do the same thing we always do. F i of z i. We got. Um, uh, let's see. So now we need. Um, if, if you kind of look at the pattern, essentially you take the linear constraint and you square it, and then you also add uh, the Lagrangian version of it, right? So, so then you're going to have plus um, over i rho over two uh, norm of z i minus x squared. Uh, notice that, by the way, I could have written this as one giant vector norm. I'm just choosing to kind of split it. Um, and then plus sum over i. And I can, again, think of lambda as actually a bunch of little lambdas, right? One per constraint, z i minus x. OK? And then that's OK. Like, the fact that I'm giving lambda like a collection of vectors, that's just semantics, right? As long as I, I optimize for, for all the lambdas at once. Cool? So. Let's optimize with respect to x. <laughs> okay. So, what am I going to do, Paul? How do I optimize for for x? Take the gradient set equal to zero. Thanks, Paul. So I'm going <laughs> to notice that all the annoying stuff is on the z's. <laughs> yeah. This is kind of cool, huh? So what, what's what's going to end up happening is I'm going to have the sum over i of rho um, z i minus x plus the sum over i, uh, oops, this gets a minus, lambda i, like that. Yeah? Hopefully I did that right. I did not do that right. That should be x minus z i. This is what happens when it's not in my notes. Okay. 
Oh, but it doesn't matter. When I differentiate with respect to x, like the squared, I can put them in any order I want. The, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, we all agree this is the gradient. So in particular, what does this mean? So by the way, let's say this is i equals 1 to, I don't know, n. Right. So then we're going to get x is going to be equal to, it actually looks an awful lot like uh, what we just uh, saw in the previous uh, algorithm, right? Slay over i lambda i plus... Um, the sum over i, uh, z i, like that. Now we have to be a little bit careful. This is the sum of x a bunch of times over. So this whole thing, I guess, is really over n. Okay? Which, by the way, kind of makes sense. Like, x is basically the average of the z i's, right? Plus this little corrector term here. Cool so far? All right. Ugh. Yeah. See, that's why like most most mathematicians teach in rooms with more than two boards. Um, okay. So uh, now let's optimize with respect to the z's. So the first thing we can do is just write our z problem, right? So we're gonna have. Remember, like, we need to optimize with respect to all the z's at once because we're thinking of this as really one big vector of variables, right? And now, what's going to be our objective? We've got sum f i of z i, like that. We have sum rho over 2. Uh, oops. z i minus x. And then uh, plus the sum over i, lambda transpose z i. Yeah. But notice that. All three of these things are summed over i, right? There's no interaction between z1 and z2. So really, this is a bunch of problems, all of the form min zi for a single zi of f zi plus rho over 2 mod zi minus x squared plus some i. Now, at least in this particular problem, sadly, we didn't end up optimizing just f. We had to add a little bit of accoutrement to it. But at least the accoutrement is pretty simple. It's like a sum. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, step three is a dual uh, update. So in particular, I guess I will get lambda i gets the i plus rho times uh, the constraint. Yeah. So algorithms of this type are called consensus. And the reason for that is the following. One step is just a giant average. <laughs> Another step is a formula. And the third step is massively parallelizable over the i's. Sneaky, huh? So in any event, I encourage you guys, like you really should open up the survey from Boyd and just look at the vast, bit, like vast uh, capability of this ADMM technique it, like to lead to all kinds of cool optimization technique um, for different sets of objectives. Yeah. And they go over some They do. And there are many versions of this. I mean, you could do the version where like, you have a variable for every vertex on a graph and a term for every edge, something like that. Yeah. Cool. OK, so that's our main pattern. And that's the main thing I wanted to cover today. We've got about 10 more minutes before we, I promise, finish talking about optimization forever. Um, and I thought it would be worthwhile to talk about one last class of optimization methods, um, just so that you guys have the complete set of buzzwords when you go out into the real world and, and read uh, papers in this, this domain. And let's talk about algorithms that are called proximal methods. Has anybody encountered a proximal method? Chris has, because he, he works in a lab with a student that does this stuff. Um, but actually, you all have, because ADMM is a proximal method. <laughs> but um, there, there, are, there, there are many uh, proximal methods. And they are all, when you hear the phrase proximal method, it's kind of a vague term in math. It just means methods that involve the following operator, which is this thing called the prox operator. Now, what does the prox operator do? It is a function. In fact, it is a thing, like for every function f, there's an associated prox operator, prox sub f. And it is the thing that takes in a point v, and it outputs the solution of the optimization problem I've written on the screen. This is weird. So it's saying, give me some balance between minimizing f and minimizing x minus v, right? Does everybody understand what this notation is saying? Let's start there. Notice that like typically the prox operator is like no easier to evaluate than solving, like minimizing f. 
you see that? Like, in particular, like, for example, it, it, let's, let's say I put a small constant in front of this least squares term, which in effect you can do by scaling f. Um, notice that like basically what it's saying is take in x and output, uh, like take in v and output the minimum of f. So like in some sense the prox operator looks really useless, right? But here's the thing, it turns out that lots of algorithms are actually built out of this thing. And in fact, if you look back, take a look at this step of ADMM that we wrote down right here on the board. This is some function plus some Distance. This is exactly a prox operator. In fact, if you complete the square, which everybody in Chris's office hours seem to struggle with, you'll, you'll get precisely the prox operator associated with, with S of I. Yeah? And so there's a whole class of methods that can be written very cleanly in terms of just this weird op object here. Right? Um, and in fact, uh, there, there are many. So ADMM is a good exercise to show that this is a proximal method. It's kind of like unsurprising because there's like that augmented Lagrangian term in there, which kind of looks like these squares. Um, there's proximal point algorithm, there's proximal gradient. So what proximal point method does is it kind of looks like gradient descent. <laughs> and in fact, this isn't a mistake. So this is the one last little piece of math that I thought we'd do in the five minutes remaining, which is to prove a little property, which is here. Um, in general, uh, of course, if I take a function f, I can, add, I can multiply it by a constant c. Right? And uh, I want to show you a little kind of fun identity involving the prox operator. as follows. So let's write out a Taylor series. In particular, I can say f of x is like roughly equal. Now interestingly, remember when we talked about um, Gauss-Newton last time? We only needed two terms in our Taylor series because we had some curvature. Notice in the prox operator we have curvature because there's this least squares term here. So maybe we do something really lame. We only write f to, to one term. We just say f of x is f of v plus um, grad f at some v, inner product x minus v, right? For really, really small values of f, that's probably okay because at least squares terms is going to dominate this prox problem, right? So in this case, what is our minimizer? Well, we need v, so, oh, sorry, so the, the, the prox of uh, associated to cf of x, well, it's roughly equal to a part of the argument with respect to, uh, oh, sorry. I like really, I, I keep, again, I keep saying the right letters. I'm writing wrong. V, just like on the board, or on the screen here. This is the argument with respect to x of f plus this least squares term. But now let's plug in our Taylor series. We're going to get f of v plus grad f v transpose x minus v. Uh, plus uh, one half x minus v squared, like that. That makes sense. And what is this thing? Well, I'll take a look. So <laughs> this is actually quadratic in x, right? I have x minus v here, and I differentiate, and I have grad f here. Oops, I scaled f by c, so I guess there's a c there. Okay. So in particular, this thing is nothing more than v minus c grad f of v. So at least for small c, notice that the prox operator and gradient descent are basically the same. So the proximal gradient algorithm, or the proximal point uh, method rather, is very simple. It's basically just like the proximal version of gradient descent. In fact, if you know anything about differential equation solvers, you might be familiar with forward versus backward Euler uh, methods. If you're not, you will be in two lectures. Um, and you might consider gradient descent to be like forward Euler and, and proximal method to be like backward Euler. And in fact, what you can show is that this thing, un, like oh, for a lot of uh, strongly convex choices of f, unconditionally converges to the minimizer. Here's the only problem. Is this a practical algorithm? No. <laughs> right, because evaluating the proximal operator, just like in ADMM, right, like, like it's sort of like saying like, sure, I can optimize f by making my algorithm optimize f as, as its steps. <laughs> Do you see that? But there are different proximal methods that are kind of built from this that actually are practical. And so I just wanted to give you a, a bit of a flavor of what that is in the next three minutes. Um, one example here, so it, it turns out there's a nice theoretical result that if you have a bad approximation of the proximal operator, this method can still converge under certain criteria for certain definitions of bad. <laughs> um, so for example, maybe you do the prox operator, but you like solve it with Newton and you kind of stop early or something like that. Um, or there are other kind of variations on the same thing. 
So for instance, let's say that I want to solve optimization on the sum f plus g, right? And maybe g by itself has an easy to, uh, to evaluate prox operator. Like, so for instance, maybe g is just like L2 norm and then f is something complicated. Then a very typical thing you can do, um, this is called the proximal gradient method. They take a gradient step in f followed by a proximal step in g and you can show that this, this technique also often converges. Okay? Um, we're about out of time, so I, I don't think we're gonna do the most fancy example of this, but maybe we can do a slightly simpler one, which is as follows. Let's solve ax equals b using the proximal method. And then we're gonna talk about why you might wanna do that. So, this is actually a technique people use in practice. Let's say that I wanna solve, uh, how did I write this? Yeah. Let's say that I want to solve ax equals b, and again, we'll, we'll assume that a is maybe positive or definite. That's actually not necessary here, but, but maybe we will. So in particular, we want to optimize that, right? But maybe a is really poorly conditioned. So like, I could use a direct solver, but like, I don't want to, because it's going to be really badly behaved. There's actually a really interesting use case for proximal algorithm in exactly this setting. So in particular, here's the thing that we can do. So uh, I think because we're out of time, I'm gonna give you a formula. I don't like to do this. I usually derive stuff in class. But specifically for this choice of f, are we all confident we could derive the prox operator with least squares plus a quadratic term, which I think we've done about 80,000 times? So what is gonna be the proximal point algorithm for this thing, so remember what that means, that just means like apply prox a bunch of times. It's gonna look like the following. It's gonna be xk plus one equal to xk plus a plus one over c as the identity inverse b minus a x. Now, this feels dumb because if I have a solver, I might as well use it. Like, like this formula has an inverse in it, right? So like why? Would I ever use this thing instead of just doing one step of solving x equals b? Paul agrees. Why am I wrong? Why, why, why might I want to actually use this method? By the way, this thing has a name, um, which might give you a hint. I forget the name. Iterative refinement. That's exactly right. Let's say that a is positive definite, but it has an eigenvalue that's really close to zero. So it's like dangerously close to being, to being non-invertible then that linear solve, like just like evaluating an inverse b, is something that I don't want to do because ill condition, I don't trust that. But if I add a multiple of the identity to a, which is a common hack people do in linear solvers anyway, <laughs> then suddenly it's better conditioning because I just took all the eigenvalues and I increased them by this factor here. The only problem is that I'm not solving the linear system I wanted to solve. So what does this method do? Well, it says, let's say I have access to the inverse of this matrix then, well, if, if you kind of squint, let's say that I, I initialize x to zero. In the first step, I'm gonna try and solve ax equals b, but I got a bad approximation because I added this identity. The next step is gonna say, okay, I'm gonna take the previous solution and I'm gonna to add to it. We're gonna take the residual, like the part that I got wrong in my linear system, and I'm gonna try and solve it again. But I still got it wrong. I added the wrong factor here. But I'm gonna add it back, and I'm just gonna keep iterating this with this better condition matrix. This method converges quite quickly, obviously, because like one step of it already is basically solving the system you wanted. And it can be a way to kind of squeeze those last couple digits of precision out of an ill-conditioned linear system. Does that make sense? And it converts to the solution of the unregularized problem? That's right. This is by, by unconditional convergence of proximal point algorithm. This is a kind of a fun, the reason that I'm, do, I'm telling you this, this is I think actually to my knowledge the only example of proximal point where the proximal operator you can actually write down in close form. Um, but it actually does have an application, which is kind of cool. All right, folks, so as promised, we're, we're, we're just about done with optimization in this class. Starting next time, even if you guys have totally been lost the last two weeks, that's fine, because we're gonna start talking about interpolation next time, um, which is a completely different problem. If you read, if you're like excited to read more, the book has some discussion of some other stuff that might be of interest to you. Um, it's out of the scope of our 12-week our uh, semester here. Um, 15 week? I don't know, whatever. Um, and that includes like global optimization, like, like if I have super non-convex problems and I can't say anything about them and I just want heuristics for like throwing darts and seeing if I can find a good minimizer. Um, and also online optimization, where as I carry out my optimization, the objective function is changing. Right, so think about like optimizing my stock portfolio. So like the second that I found the right stock portfolio, all the prices change. And so like, 
there's this interesting setting where like I'm optimizing a function that I don't know, and then I only get to know the function after I chose my optimum. <laughs> so like think about you know, I'd like to maximize my profits at the end of the day, but I only know the stock prices this morning. So I optimize based on the last ten days, and I want a method that in in, in, in likelihood works out well. Yeah. Okay. So in any event, that concludes part. I guess two of this course, we started linear algebra, we did optimization. Part three is going to be roughly everything else. <laughs> okay, so with that, I will see you on Thursday, Tuesday? Tuesday. I will see you on Tuesday. Have a lovely weekend and do your homework.